Today we'll be discussing all things Canada, including our favorite Canadian entertainment, and we'll be discussing the discovery of insulin. This is Doctor vs. Comedian. I'm Dr. Asif Doja, and this is the Doctor of Laughs. Not a real doctor. Ali Hassan. Every episode, I pick a topic for Ali from comedy and entertainment, and I question him about it. Then Ali picks a topic from medicine and health and grills me on that topic. Today, we have a special episode on all things Canada. We'll be discussing Ali hosting the Canada Day celebrations in the nation's capital, and we'll also discuss our favorite Canadian entertainment. And we'll also be discussing the Canadian discovery of insulin. You want to sing on Canada? I wanted to sing God Save America because we helped save America with insulin. We didn't, we didn't save it, but we're helping them out. You're welcome, America. Okay, so let's get started with this. Canada Day was last week. Big celebration, kind of people celebrating again after a couple of years of the pandemic. Probably lots of COVID going around, being spread about everywhere. But mm -hmm. anyway, we'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks. But I want to start off this section, Ali. We're going to talk about our favorite Canadian entertainment, and we'll get to that in a minute. But you hosted the Canada Day celebrations in Ottawa, where I live. You were here. I didn't see you, except I saw you on the television. You were quite busy. But it was broadcast across the nation. And okay, let's start off with how you got involved with this whole Canada Day celebration. I wish I could trace it to like one particular thing. I don't think I can. I just, I don't know, man. I was just thrilled to be asked. You know, this is something like in my heroes and mentors have done in the past. Rick Mercer has hosted this, you know, Jan Arden will have hosted, like really big Canadian names will host the Canada Day celebration. And yeah, I was definitely happy they asked. I don't think I was their number one choice. They probably asked about a dozen people. <laughs> I was the most <laughs> available. But that being said, I really am quite happy with how it went. And so were they. And I got the feeling that this team was like, well, this won't be why am I saying I got the feeling? I was told repeatedly, this will not be the last time we work together. So I can't hope for anything better than that. And I don't think I even fully appreciated the fact that this was the televised show because, you know, classically it's been on Parliament Hill, Parliament Hill, bit of an explosive uh, venue these days. So uh, they changed it to Le Breton Flats. All I know about Le Breton Flats Park in Ottawa is that it's where... Ottawa's Blues Fest takes place. Correct, yeah. Otherwise, I had never been there. I didn't know where it was located. I had only ever heard it associated with Blues Fest. A fantastic festival, by the way, Asif, I will say on your city's behalf, that has very little to do with blues anymore. They have massive, massive acts, and as they will in a few weeks from now. So I didn't even know where Le Breton Flats was. I wasn't even fully aware that this was the Canada Day show that was going to be televised nationally. That sort of like came up after I said yes to the gig, which is classic. Uh, you know, uh, Ali Hassan's career has been built on saying yes to things that he had no idea he was getting into and then just doing the best job he could and, and making a meal out of it. So pretty on brand for me. I will say this, I'm not generally an anxious person, but my daughter did live in Ottawa this past year. She was in her first year at Ottawa U. We were getting multiple times daily updates about the freedom protest in Ottawa. So it wasn't just a news thing I was reading about. It was, my daughter is there. So I was reading, I was listening. I was also getting my daughter, you know, sort of saying like, we're like choking on these diesel fumes. The city like smells so bad and they're honking all night. We can't study. We cannot sleep. And we go outside and we're getting heckled by people who are like clearly not locals. They're just like walking around near the campus and being like, you're sheep. Take off your mask. Don't be stupid. You know, this kind of thing. And so I was like, you know, very obviously sad for my daughter who I encouraged to go to Ottawa U to begin with, right? And she was like, this is not the Ottawa you promised. I was like, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> so I, I have to say, you know, there was news items about the freedom protesters are coming back and the convoy is going to come back and God knows what's left to protest about, but they were going to come back. 
And, you know, as somebody said in a tweet, they were like, I'm not saying the convoy protesters are dumb, but I am saying they're driving across the country at a time where gas prices are at a record high <laughs> to protest something that doesn't need. Anyway, so it, that's how I felt. I was like, this is so dumb. But as my brother-in-law told me years ago, a line that always sticks, you can't reason with the unreasonable, right? So this, it, it looked like this was going to happen. And it really didn't. It was like this very fragmented kind of... First of all, the police presence was insane, and I know that because we were staying in the same hotel as the police. Oh, I wow. thought there had been some police operation, and I asked one of the officers when we got into this hotel, I was like, should we be worried? Should we feel safe? I see a lot of police officers. He goes, oh, no, no. We're just here because the beds are very comfortable. And I was like, what? <laughs> What's, what is he talking about? Turns out that you know the, the third floor of the hotel was debriefing, mission control, all that. So all these officers were there. So we were really in the safest place and they were mobilized. And I asked one of the officers, how are you feeling about this apprehensive? And he was like, I'm ready for anything. I was like, okay, that doesn't come from me. That's a little bit of a machismo that I didn't need in front of my children. But, you know, they were ready for anything and it felt like they were ready to clamp down. And, and I think they probably did in ways that we don't even fully know about and really kept it to nothing. I was concerned that, you know, when you're on television, it is tight. Like, we are going to commercial at this second, so you better be clear. You better not be talking. And you be, better be done this, because then the band has to go on, because the band has been told to play a two-minute and 30-second song. And then you better be, the, you know, like, it's all so precise, which is not what I'm used to. I'm used to a fairly loosey-goosey stand-up comedy where, you know, I might open the show with 10, or I might host 15 off the top if something's going well, do some crowd work, and, you know, I love working off the crowds there's none of that and so i was just thinking about some heckles you know like i don't know liberal cuck you know murder the prime minister so i didn't know what was going to be happening there so i yeah i was i was definitely concerned most of the Canadian beer bottle in the face. Yeah, yeah 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 the old the exactly stuff thrown onto the you know i, I just didn't know and you know, basic decency and enthusiasm for the day, the new era, I guess, uh, it prevailed. And it was it was great. It was really, really good. And Sean Majumder was hosting. And people don't know who Sean Majumder is. He's a Canadian household name. Used to be a, a correspondent and, and cast member of This Hour Has 22 Minutes for something like 15, 16 seasons actor, host. So he was with another broadcaster named Anne-Marie Wittenshaw. He was hosting the daytime show, which was more like the prime minister spoke, dignitaries were there. They're not letting me around the dignitaries yeah, just yeah. yet, right? Okay, you got to graduate to that. So Sean was there in the day. I hosted in the evening, which was more of a musical sort of variety show with Isabel Rassico, who is a phenomenal Quebec host and, and, and real, real huge talent. And just watching her move backstage, watching how she operates and she knows everybody and people love her and respect her. It was great to see that and be with her. But Sean Majim just showed me a picture of somebody he had come across in the day. And it was a man, an older white man with a wagon, a red wagon that you might put a child or two in. He had the Freedom Wagon and he had put up some cardboard on the side of it and painted it all red and the words tyranny and freedom were there. And that picture was so sad to me and simultaneously funny. It kind of encapsulated where the freedom protest movement was with a four, four-wheeled children's wagon done up with buzzwords that make no sense. And that's basically it. So it was amazing. I went in trepidation, anxiety was top of mind, and it turned out to be all for nothing. But it, and it was it was like a great day, and, and the, the the televised special went super well. And you know, it was just the first time I did it. I, I felt pretty comfortable. It took me about a half an hour to really feel totally at ease, which is not bad. It's a two hour show, and full respect to all the people who were there. Some of them as early as four p.m. waiting until eight to see the show, and then fireworks afterwards. And it was great. I really had a good time, and I'm so happy the, the way it all went down. And we're going to talk about some Canadian music in a second, but you had a lot of uh, great Canadian oh acts God. from all over the country. How was that? It's just a reminder of how much talent there is in this 
country. And so I'll sometimes guest host on a show called Q on CBC Radio. It's the premier sort of arts and culture show in this country. And we're always playing Canadian music. So a lot of these bands are bands that I will play or I will have like, for example, Lisa LeBlanc is somebody who played in the day I've interviewed her and she played, you know, sort of 10 feet away from me. And she's just like fantastic. This kind of like I don't even know what she calls it. She calls it something like uh, dirty country rock or something like that. But it's like really fun and amazing. And so, and I played Charlotte Cardin before and Ariane Moffat. And so they were there on stage. So Charlotte Cardin, I encourage you to look up. Yeah, she's great. She's fantastic. Amazing. Ariane Moffat is like an instant. I mean, 20 years she's been in this business. Her music is amazing. But then also, you know, flipping to William Prince, who was in the in the Northwest Territories, flipping over to Johnny Reed, who was performing in Vancouver, to Neon Dreams, who was performing in Halifax. And it was just like this, like... I love that Neon Dreams. Snapshot. Those guys are Neon amazing. Dreams. I mean, totally I've never good. heard of them before. I'm like, oh, these oh, guys is that are right? awesome. Okay. Yeah, these guys are awesome. Yeah, Neon Dreams is great. Uh, Sal Barb was there live as well. They were fantastic. It's just a reminder of how much incredible music talent there is out there and coming out of Canada. And they were... I was like, after the rehearsal the night before, I was like, this is exciting. Like the stage was amazing. The, the whole stage set up and the performances on stage, really, really great. Two things I noticed, you know, obviously it's like a performance show. So you'll have one act and then the host, then the other act. Like they got to have all the, the equipment, all the instruments, and everything ready to go. And I always think to myself, why can't they do that when you go see a regular concert, right? Why is it, it there's like an hour between the opening act and then the next act or the sure. uh, set this up. So why can't you just have them all the setups together like they do on these shows? Absolutely. And you know, it's the teamwork of these, I don't even know what they're you know, like we used to call them roadies back in the day, but I think that's just like, it almost feels pejorative to call them roadies. You know, you got like these six guys, eight or guys, maybe yeah. technicians who, you know, a song ends and then they are rolling out a grand piano and it's like three, two, one lift. And they're lifting it up five feet to get it on the podium at the front while, you know, Isabel and I were talking. And even though I know it's happening, part of me is like, when the hell did that piano get there? Mm -hmm. Right? That's how it's like great service at a restaurant. You don't even realize your glass has been refilled or your plate has been taken. You know, there's this sort of grace that certain servers have the way they sort of move in and out. And they're, it's like Buster Bluth, uh, seen, never heard type of vibes. These guys work in the shadows and just get stuff done like uh, so efficiently and make it look effortless. It's amazing, which is why all of them know each other and it's team people you can rely on and because it's thankless jobs, right? Nobody's mm -hmm. ever thanking them, but it's stuff that has to be done perfectly or the show is going <laughs> to derail, all right? You can't have Charlotte and Cardin on a beautiful grand, a white baby grand piano, not baby, grand piano that then starts rolling off stage because somebody yeah. forgot to like lock the wheels in place, right? So it's... Uh, Incredible, incredible effort put in by so many people to make it great. And yeah, I mean, and like I said, lots of great performances. You had Walk Off the Earth. Oh my God, how can I forget? They, Dude, they were there. Walk Off the Earth is fantastic. And I know this band because my daughter really likes them and I played them before too. Really, really good band. I'm in the hotel and I told you my anxiety is high. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, cops are here. And then I go, oh man, there's some freedom protesters here too. There's a group of freedom protesters. You know, they're like sort of bearded. There's some beards. There's some tattoos. There's this kind of like attitude of like, we don't care about stuff, but we do care. And I'm like, I think those are freedom protesters. Get to the rehearsal that night. It's walk off the earth. That's oh, no. who that was. I was so embarrassed. I even told one of the, the band members, I go, I got to admit something to you. I got to get this off my chest. I feel so embarrassed because I actually know the band too, but it's just. In the old days, I was watching videos all the time. You knew what every band looked like. You're cutting out, you know, posters from magazines and you knew exactly mm -hmm. what. There's no way Mick Mars, the bassist from Motley Crue, is going to walk by me on the street and I'm not going to be like, that was Mick Mars, right? Mm -hmm. I, could, I knew everybody. Now I don't know what half these bands look like. So anyway, that was awful. And I think once that happened, I was also like, I think I need to calm down, okay? Mm -hmm. Not everyone's a cop or a protester. There's also a whole... But what did they say when you told them that story? He laughed and he went and told one of his bandmates, check this out. The host <laughs> thought we were freedom, freedom protesters. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I told him with the exact truth. I was like, 
and I'm awfully, awfully embarrassed about myself for thinking that way. So it wasn't like, hey man, check this out. I thought you guys were, you know, it wasn't that. I was genuinely embarrassed. So I think it went over well, but they do think I'm a ding dong and that's okay. You Mm -hmm. know, that happens too. (laughs) They may not be wrong. So I guess this is a nice segue, not quite the ding dong part, but segueing into bands. And so I thought, here's what we're going to do. Ding okay. dong's a musical sound, buddy. This is a That's perfect right. segue. It is. Ding it is. Dong. Okay. So I challenged Ali the other night when we were talking about this episode. I said, I want you to pick the following things, a musician or band, a movie and a TV show that best represents Canada in your mind, something that's distinctly Canadian that kind of exemplifies what Canada is all about. So, you know, you could interpret that however you want. You could say it's the best Canadian show that I've seen. It's the one that I think, you know, when I watch it, I think about Canada. You know, if I'm outside the country, I think about it. I don't know. I just kind of left it open because I thought it'd be interesting to just kind of throw this challenge out to Ali. And then I'll pick some as well. So, yeah. And then our listeners can tell us afterwards, you know, did you agree, disagree? Do you think these examples were good? They're bad. So why don't we get into it? We'll start off with musician first. Is that yeah, okay? musician was the easiest part of this for me. Movie and TV show is much more difficult yeah. to really put it down to one. And I was thinking, should we even include those? But I think it's good because there could be some movies or TV shows or bands, actually, once I say my band. If, you, if you're young, you'll be like, what are they, what are they talking about? but that people may want to check out. So why don't you tell us your band? The band that I feel best exemplifies Canada is... The Tragically Hip. And I'll tell you why I say that so quickly and without even hesitation is because, you know, you can, what about Drake? What about Justin Bieber? What about these guys who've hit it big? That to me is not what exemplifies Canada. I'm very happy for the success that Drake and Justin Bieber have and the fact that we can throw those names into the face of Americans who might be like, well, Canada, Canada, puny little Canada. What does Canada do, right? But as far as exemplifies Canada, I mean, for me, all these concerts where, you know, these big names were playing, they didn't, like in in the US, they didn't know about the Tragically Hip, one of the greatest bands, incredible body of work, and kind of like Maestro Fresh West, they never cracked into the mainstream of America, and that's what made them so beautifully Canadian. They were like our little secret, and it was a, if you know, you know, and if you don't, I just feel bad for you. I'm not even trying to tell you about the Tragically Hip, because you just got to know. And if you don't, you're out of the loop, man. They're the best. And I don't even need to prove that to anybody. And so there was something so special about having this band that was like our own band. And also, you know, I, it, it helps that I saw them in concert and stage dove, stood beside Gord Downey. It, it helps that Gord Downey himself was a champion and an advocate for indigenous rights. It helps that he tried to entertain and educate at the same time. It helps that the band is all like decent human beings. I don't know of any like, you know, domestic abuse or DUIs or anything like that. It just feels like these are good. And even if they had that, I mean, (laughs) I'm in a place where I'm like, oh God, I'm going to ignore that story because this is how good the band is, you know, but luckily I don't have to do that. And my hand is not forced. I just... I attached myself to this band and their talent and and everything that they stood for, and they've been great. It's hard to disagree with that. These guys, what I love about the band, one of the things is that they incorporate Canadiana into their songs, right? And then you read about the background behind their songs. That's right. New Orleans is Sinking is actually about New Orleans, Ontario. A lot of people don't know that. I didn't. uh, That's not true. Yeah. But, you know, they talk about Bill Barilko, they talk about the Leafs, the, you know, all this stuff is ingrained in their music, and they're not embarrassed about it, they're not ashamed of it, they're proud Canadians. I think, you know, there's no right or wrong answers, but I think that is mm. definitely a right answer. The other band that comes to mind for me is, and it's not my pick, but is Blue Rodeo. Of course, man. Another great, like, beautifully, tightly held Canadian secret, if you know, you know, like, just Jim Cuddy's voice that angel of a you know, angelic voice is just so fantastic 
both those bands, you know, you play their songs. Like you can go to a concert, even if you don't you don't have any of their albums, and you'll probably know like 75 to 80 percent of the songs, you know, it just mm. because they're played so much, they're they're part of Canadian history. Okay, what's your choice? What's your pick? So my band is as follows. The Northern Pikes. You know what? I wish I'd put money on this. I, I wish this was I, a betting I knew operation. You knew. I knew you of knew. Of course, listeners, you have to understand that if there were only like three fans left in the world of the Northern Pikes, Asif would be not just one of them, but he would be the sort of the team lead. He would be organizing those three fans to go see the Northern Pikes in, you know, he would go to like Hudson Bay. You would, you would travel to go see this band. You love them from day one. You've never stopped loving them, and you're unapologetic about it. I remember your your CD collection, always like marveling at how much Canadiana was in mm -hmm, there, and the mm -hmm. Northern Pikes were always front and center. And I was like, bought the CD, huh? And you're like, of course. <laughs> I just think that they they really represent. I mean, they're from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, been around for Respect. about thirty years or so. I mean, they're named after a Northern Pike, a fish found in in freshwater lakes in Canada and the northern part of this continent. I mean, and you know, these guys were they were kind of an alternative band back when you know back in the eighties and uh, early nineties, and then they kind of hit a big. Most people just kind of know them from She Ain't Pretty, which is you know I think not necessarily one of my favorite songs from them. Their albums are so deep and have so many good tracks that I think, you know, you can't, don't want to try and dismiss them just by their big hit song. They're great. I've, you know, met them all. Jay Semko is, I don't know if he's for friends, but we're certainly acquaintances like on Facebook and things like that. I've met him several times. He's one of the singers and one of the main songwriters of the band. I just think they exemplify can. I think when you think of it, a Canadian band, that's to me who it is. There's lots of other ones, like we said. They're so Canadian, Ali, that mm. now they added a new member who's Kevin Kane, who's from the Grapes of Wrath, which is That's another so classic so Canadian funny. band from the 80s and 90s. So they are my pick for, I, again, like I said, you know, if you say Tragic Clip of Blue Rodeo, of course, you know, those are all kind of correct things. But as Ali said, this is a personal thing for me because it's like my favorite Canadian band. Okay, so let's move on to uh, movies. So we don't have any music for these movies because I don't, I don't really know the theme songs or the scores. So what's your Canadian movie? I remember, we had to pick one. I mean, yeah. Ali, Ali's like, it's so hard to pick just one. No, you got to just pick one for the purposes of this exercise. Yeah, but can I not give some respect to some? Yes. See, here's yeah, the sure. thing. I work every year for the last few years. I have worked with an organization called Real Canada. And real, as in R E E L, mm -hmm. movie real. I figured it out. They celebrate Canada Film Day. That's their big event. I think it's April 21st. It's National Canadian Film Day. And so I've had the booklets over the years from them about like what qualifies as Canadian. And sometimes it's just location, sometimes it's just director, sometimes it's like, you know, the writer, but then it was filmed in like Mexico or something. But I didn't want to go that loose. I wanted to be like, for example, Crash is referred to as a Canadian movie because it is directed by David Cronenberg and he's Canadian, but that, I don't know, you know, David Cronenberg is, he's not that Canadian anymore. I don't even think he's, he's I, I agree. You know, a lot of people will say Eastern Promises, which is one of his movies with Viggo Mortenstern, which I love. I mean, the movie's amazing, but amazing. you know, it sounds bad, but I think David Cronenberg has surpassed Canada. Like he's an international yes. star, as you said, yeah. international director. And so yeah, it I is a bit, is that. a bit unfair, but okay, go ahead. Okay. So, but I have to, I would be remiss. And if there's a word stronger than remiss, somebody please tell me, I would be an idiot to not give some respect to the Quebec. We are talking about Canada. We have to get the Quebec film industry. First of all, it gets a lot of support. It gets a lot of money. It gets a lot of encouragement. I have to mention movies like La Grande Seduction, right? The Grand mm -hmm. Seduction was made of it. I have to mention Crazy, movie. which is an amazing film. And one of my favorites of all time, which I encourage you to see immediately, is called Incendie. And it's a uh, Academy Award nominated. It is, I mean, just uh, this mind bending. I thought was going to be your pick. Oh, you did? Because you love it so much. I, I thought. I it do was... love it. I love Denis Villeneuve I as well. I had that in my head. Yeah, oh, amazing. Uh, well, amazing. 
Once you're done watching Incendie, if you have not seen it or rewatch it, Starbuck, the original, you know, the one for out of Quebec is a fantastic movie because there have been many remakes. That's why I say the one out of Quebec. So the one with Patrick Huard, it's so good. Bon Cop, Bad Cop also. Yeah. You know, the late, great Kevin Tierney, one of my favorite human beings, deserves some respect. There's also Café de Flore, Monsieur Lazar. Anyway, I, Quebec film is to be watched and celebrated. I picked something not Québécois. I also picked something you're going to mock me for, which is uh, because I was in it. That's not why I'm picking it. I'm not picking it because I'm in it. I'm picking it because I thought it really embraced Canadiana. It is the movie Goon. Mm-hmm. Jay Baruchel, proud Canadian in it. A little known Eugene Levy. Not a little known. Eugene Levy's in it. A few other, you know, great names gone on to do some some wonderful things. And, you know, just it's such a hockey movie. And it's not like, you know, it's we're regarded stereotypically as this nonviolent sort of pacifist country, which is just not the truth. I mean, every single night in bars across Canada, there are scraps happening for no reason. People just look at each other. You want to go? Yeah, you want to go. And they go and scrap. I mean, this this country also loves to fight and celebrates fighting. And also, I am such a huge fan of Marc-André Grandin. Like he, another Quebecois actor, anything he does, I would just go see it. I would recommend it to anybody even before having seen it. But it's great. Kim Coates is also in it. He's great. Canadian dude. And yeah, Sean William Scott is not Canadian. He's the lead, but he is kind of like an honorary Canadian. Yeah. I think he grew up in either Northern Michigan or Wisconsin, Minnesota. It's Minnesota. And so he's yeah, basically- Yeah, it's as Canadian. close as you can get. Yeah. He's as close as you can get. He's got the same vibe. He hates LA. He told me he's much more of a New York person where he can just kind of live his life, hates the fame and celebrity of it all. You're right. So my pick is Goon for a bunch of reasons that I just uh, outlined. And not one of them is that I'm in it. I'm in it for like less than, you know, 40 seconds. And I loved it. It was one of the first things, first movies I was ever in after French Immersion, which is also Kevin Tierney directed, but it has nothing to do with me. I just, I've seen it so many times and I've, I've just loved it. It's a great film. Yeah, it is great. I mean, like I, I didn't say to you, you couldn't pick one that you're not in, and I, but I think it's a great film. So good, it's a great choice. And it filmed in Winnipeg, right? Is that what you said? Filmed in Winnipeg. Winnipeg. Yeah, cold, I mean, amazing. Cold yeah. November amazing. Winnipeg. Yeah, that was something. Overnight shoot too for me. I was thinking about this a lot, and a lot of the movies you mentioned, I liked. I thought a lot about Goon as well, but I picked Adam Goyen's The Sweet Hereafter. Ah, uh, very nice. You know. Adam Agoyan, especially in kind of the mid to late 90s, was just firing on all cylinders. He made Exotica, of course. For this, after this, he made Ararat, which is about the Armenian genocide. It's actually not quite about that. It's actually about how history it, it can be interpreted in different ways by different people, often yeah. the winners and losers in conflicts. His wife is Armenian, by the way. So is he. They're both Armenian. I forgot. Yeah. Egoyhan. Egoyhan yeah. is, yeah, yeah. So I think I've told the story before, but I, I met Adam Egoyan at this play. We were both like, just, I don't know, looking at the cast, you know, the pictures of the cast outside. And I'm like, oh, hey. I'm like, hey, I just saw your movie last week. And so we were, we chatted for like, you know, 30 seconds or less. So Sweet Hereafter, I think it's his pinnacle. I think Adam Agoyan, I don't know what happened, but in the past kind of 20 years, has kind of been less prominent of a filmmaker, you know, for I'm sure various reasons. I mean, he's in his 60s now, right? In the 80s is when he was part of that Toronto new wave yeah. of, of directors. So yeah, let the guy rest. And I think he's taking on some commercial products as well, some commercial movies. So anyway, but this movie, you know, the plot of it is that there's a school bus accident in this small town in British Columbia, and a lawyer comes to the town to kind of get everybody invested in a, a class action lawsuit mm -hmm. against the bus company and the school and the city and things like that. It's what kind of evolves out of that. We got uh, Ian Holm in it, Sarah Pauly, you know, Sarah Pauly, amazing actress. This is one of her best performances ever. Bruce Greenwood, who I think is just, I mean, he he's excellent in every single he's movie flawless. he's in. He's, Bruce Greenwood yeah. does not get enough respect. That guy is really, really good. You kind of forget he's acting. And the reason why I like this movie is movies can be about a lot of things. They can be about plot. They can be about action. They can be about character development and, and a character arc changing over time. But this movie is one of the few movies that's about a mood. And it's mm -hmm. about grief. 
And this movie, grief permeates every single frame of this, even though it's, it's shot in a way which has a lot of overexposure and, and brightness to it. It is about grief. And I just, I've never seen a movie like that prior to this. And so, I mean, it's definitely sad to watch and it's about grief. So, I mean, obviously you got to feel a certain way coming out of it. I don't know if I really want to watch it like five more times again in my life because it is sometimes mm, a difficult I'm going to watch it again, just based on this reminder that you've given me. I've somehow... I like contained sadness. I don't like being sad for long periods of time. Yes. But if I'm going to be sad for 90 minutes because of somebody's work, I'm okay with that. So anyway, I do think it's one of the peaks. Again, you talked about this Canadian cinema on these auteurs coming from Quebec and elsewhere. I think this is probably the peak of that in the 90s. Again, you had the, the predominance of independent film in the US and this kind of coincided with that. So yeah, that, that's my pick. That movie got Academy Award nominations for both Best Director and Best Adapted Screenplay. So it has been recognized far and wide, not just Asif's opinion. If anybody listens to this podcast and immediately wants to squash anything that's Asif's personal opinion, I can respect that. But that's not what's going on here. Even Roger Ebert was like, this movie is fantastic. So great TV shows. Okay. So TV shows, Ali, why don't you tell us your, you know... TV show that you think best exemplifies Canada? There was a show years ago. I thought it was called Made in Canada, but it's called The Industry. Do you remember that show? Rick Mercer and Peter Callahan, Leah Pinson. Does I that thought mean it was anything? called Made in Canada too. That's yeah. so strange. Isn't that crazy? But uh, when you go and look it up, the original title was Made in Canada. And then I don't know when they renamed it to The Industry. I, I Maybe it was... I don't know if it was after the fact or what, but Made in Canada was a really amusing show. And Dan Lett is so good at playing Victor. In that. I, I think if there's a way that you can find that show and watch it, it is great. I also really like The Newsroom, which it almost ran for nine years. I did not realize that. Ken Finkelman, Peter Callahan again, who is just so great in, in these roles of like, you know, pompous boss. The comedy just oozes from him without in any effort. Karen Hines is in that. So those shows are definitely on the short list. I also grew up with Bizarre and Wayne and Schuster. So mm -hmm. they have to, I mean, these oh, yeah. are Bizarre in particular, you know, the introduction to Super Dave Osborne, it, like people see him now on Curb Your Enthusiasm. And I'm like, dude, this guy's been around for so long, like early eighties, I was laughing at Super Dave, Bob Einstein, full full respect to that guy. My choice is is more modern. I think it might be yours too, but I'm not sure about it. And I, of course, I have to give respect to Run the Burbs. I love what they're doing. I love the whole, you know, idea behind that show about celebrating diversity, celebrating these sort of different identities of Canada. Kids in the Hall, which we did a whole episode on is like number one and a half for me, seminal piece of co comedic work. But I have to go with Schitt's Creek. Mm -hmm. I have to go with Schitt's Creek. There's something to me about telling a story about a gay character and never making a meal out of the homosexuality. To me, that's like, we've made it. And the other times I felt that is Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec, Aziz Ansari played Tom Haverford. And I think eventually they, they you know, they had to go, they, they're running out of stories at one point and they talked about his background. But for a long time, he's a brown guy named Tom Haverford. Just deal with it. Whereas, you know, when they're like, oh, he's a brown guy and he has this accent and this is where he comes from. And there's a funny story about like immigration and like, you know, the struggle that has to be part of it. I love it when that's not there. I love treating human beings like human beings. And it's, it's really like my favorite thing to see, so, which is, it sounds so simple and basic, but that's what made Schitt's Creek especially great for me. But also I grew up with Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara on SCTV and to have those two, like you can't buy that type of dynamic. You cannot buy that relationship on screen. That's like in hockey, just knowing where your partner's going to be before you, your line mate's going to be before you make the assist. 
it just felt like that. They just knew each other's moves. And I would have loved to have been there sort of watching the multiple takes because there's a beauty of that in comedy, knowing your partner and knowing exactly how to feed them the right line to get the best out of them. And they come out of, you know, that sketch world where it is very collaborative. So you are trying to collaborate. You're not trying to steal the scene and the other person is always handing off to you in the, in the best way so that you could steal the scene. You're ne- you know, it's a, there's a selflessness about it. So I love the comedy element there and I also love the storytelling of it. And it took me a while to get into it. But once I was in, I was like, this show is great. And not a well-kept secret in the end, thanks to the pandemic. It's rare that we thank the pandemic, but the pandemic led a lot of people to sort of discover Schitt's Creek and really, really help put it on the map and then win Emmy Awards because of that. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, I can't really disagree with you about anything you said. I think definitely one of the ones I thought about, again, maybe it's because it's recent, maybe because we watched over the pandemic. I agree with everything you said. I think it has one of the best, if not the best, romance and love story between two characters I think I've ever seen, certainly in a Mm. sitcom ever, with David and Patrick. Again, the fact that they're gay is is. You know, it's part of the story, but it's not the story. Yeah. And I think it's it's amazing. And, you know, every country has its issues, obviously. But this is kind of an aspirational show, right? To be kind to others, to be a show about caring and, and funny, but still funny, you know? I don't know. It's a great pick. You know, hard to disagree with that. Other things on my list, you know, I thought a lot about, you know, there's, there's lots of things. Beachcombers, as you said, Wade and yeah. Schuster, right? These are kind of things that ex- – Littlest Hobo, right? <laughs> These exemplify Canadian television. But I thought about a lot about Kids in the Hall and Schitt's Creek. I think those are groundbreaking in their own ways with all the other shows you mentioned. But I picked one that I think is groundbreaking in a different way. And it has to do with the fact that this, I was basically the age of the characters when it came on. And so my pick is as follows. That's right, Ali. Degrassi Junior High. Oh, of course. It's good that one of us has given that show some respect. It certainly deserves it. And we will, people have asked us to cover Degrassi on the podcast. We will do a further deep dive into it, including some special guests. But I think we're going to wait till there's a new HBO reboot that's coming out Mm. relatively soon. So we'll probably wait for that. But we will devote a whole episode. But, you know, this was a successor to Kids of Degrassi Street. It was only on for a couple of years and they changed it to Degrassi High. And then, mm. which was again, again, these were only on for like two or three years. I thought they were on for like 10 years, but it was a short I period think, of time. I think that's a testament to the storytelling. Yes, exactly. When you had like a pregnant teen in the school right. and there's drug use and this and that, it was like extended after school specials on steroids. That's it was right. just such compelling storytelling and it, it really grabbed you in. Yeah, I think you're right. I also felt like, it was a decade. It felt like it was a decade long. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And again, you had addressing all these issues, teenage pregnancy, abortion, homosexuality, shoplifting, and you know, even Caitlin had epilepsy. They all had their different aspects. And I think it showed what Canadian television could do, that it could kind of make a difference, push boundaries in a way that it really hadn't before, appeal to kids. And then, of course, it was broadcast in the U.S. And, you know, that's why we had a lot of filmmakers, like Kevin Smith is kind of the classic one who was so influenced by Degrassi and mm-hmm. loved it and, you know, even appeared on the, I forget what it was, when they had the adults from Degrassi, they, they kind of did a, a reboot movie or something like that, and he was on it, and he's directed some episodes of the new Degrassi as well. So, Yeah, I just think it was excellent. And again, it probably has something to do with me being around the same age as those characters when they're on it. Again, played by real 
you know, people with very little acting experience because the producers wanted this to be as genuine as possible to like the, the teen experience and the preteen experience. So anyway, that's my choice. Great choice. Great choice. Got to give it to you. That's very, very thoughtful. We spent a lot of time on that last category, which has left us with, I don't want to rush through this at all. It's a fantastic Canadian invention. Insulin is what we're going to talk about. Johnny Bunting and David Best? Huh? <laughs> Ricardo and Alejandro? Close. Frederick Banting Frederick, and Charles I knew Best. Him. And who and, Best? Oh, sorry, I missed that. And Charles Best. Charles, that's right. So we're going to have to go through this because the twists and turns of the story are quite interesting. But why don't we start off with, Ali, how is your knowledge of diabetes? That's a loaded question. You Not can your see knowledge. you're well aware of my personal knowledge. Now, first of all, let's just say this. Both of us are South Asian. And both of us, because we are brown, South Asian, you know, particularly people who are part of the diaspora, we know a fair amount of diabetes, even if you're not a doctor, you will just know because inevitably somebody in the family has diabetes. And we really, for years, downplayed it. You know, I think the translation in Urdu is like, oh, he has a touch of sugar. He has the sugar, something like that. You know, it's like weird how, and then you learn about diabetes and you're like, hey, your touch of sugar could mean you lose your feet. Mm -hmm, like, what do you, mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. we might want to take this a little bit more seriously, but we're number one. I don't know if we're number one, but South Asians, we're doing well in the diabetes world. If it was a competition, we'd be winning. Combination of, I guess, our diet, our genetics, our lifestyle choices, and it's a perfect storm for not just heart disease, which, what's another, we're, we're a leader there too, but diabetes also, we're really, we're at very high risk for diabetes as brown people. So when you're asking me what my knowledge is, I jokingly, you know, made fun of Banting and Best's first names, but I did know that insulin was a Canadian invention. And I did know that, you know, the basics about diabetes and I have friends with type one and type two, but I'm not the guy to explain that obviously, because I'll mess up some details, but I think insulin, I think, you know, we can talk about like how it came to be invented here and when it was and what the need was back mm -hmm. then. It's a reminder of how long diabetes yeah. has been a thing. And so we're actually, 2021 was the 100th anniversary of the discovery of okay. insulin. So we're 101 years now. And so let's just take a step back for a second about diabetes. The diabetes you were talking about is type 2 diabetes that has more of a genetic component. And what that is, it's, and that could occur usually more in adults, but it can occur in kids rarely. That's what we call insulin resistance. Although isn't type two on the rise with younger and younger it is, people? It is. It yes, is. Okay. Yeah. And we should probably do a whole episode on that because it is a concerning trend that's been noticed over mm -hmm. time. So what happens is, and they all have to do with insulin. So with type two diabetes, you have insulin resistance. So insulin's job is to take sugar that's in your bloodstream and move it into your cells. So that's what insulin does. And it's done via the pancreas. Is that right? So the pancreas creates insulin. Okay, yeah. And we'll talk about the cells in a second that actually create it. So the pancreas is vital to it, and insulin is what's responsible for moving sugar into your cells, okay? And so type 2 diabetes, you have insulin resistance. So insulin doesn't work as well as it normally does, okay? So that's why some people have to take extra insulin, or they have to take other medicines that help to help with their sugar control. Type 1 diabetes is juvenile, known as juvenile, or we don't say that anymore? It is, but you don't have to be a juvenile to get it, though it usually occurs in the first decade of life or the second decade of life is usually mm. when you get it. Yeah. And that is this presumed immune, autoimmune attack on these cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. And then you have decreased insulin production. So then you need to take extra, what we say exogenous insulin, right? In order to control the symptoms. So you can see, so that's a big deal. So what actually happens with people with diabetes is they actually have high blood sugar. So this is one of the funny things that people always get wrong about diabetes. You know, first of all, you know, eating lots of sugar doesn't cause diabetes in general, though obesity is associated with type two diabetes. But what happens when you have diabetes before your diagnosis, your blood sugar levels will be high. 
right? Because your body is not able to take that sugar that's circulating in your bloodstream and put it into your cells, okay? And the excess sugar that's floating around your bloodstream can end up causing problems, right? And the problems you mentioned, it can cause vascular problems, which can cause necrosis and even gangrene of your limbs Feet, and your toes. Yeah, and yeah. that's why you get what you were talking about. So that's a problem with the vasculature. It can cause similar problems in the eyes. That's why people can go blind from diabetes. And then a lot of the other complications that we know, heart disease, etc. So you can see why when you're talking about the early part of the 20th century, like it would be very imperative to try and do something because how would you help people with diabetes before? We knew diabetes existed before. That was kind of well established. Even if you look at old, you know, Egyptian and Greek physicians, they knew about this entity of diabetes. Really? Yeah. yeah. And, and then you might remember, like, you may have heard about the idea of, of these doctors in ancient times actually tasting urine because it's sweet because the sugar that's floating around in your bloodstream will be present in the urine as well. And when you say in ancient times, are you referring to when you were in med school? Is that a weird week of med school where you guys all have to take a sip or do we not? We just take their word for it. That didn't happen. Okay. So they knew that diabetes would occur, but we obviously had no real way of treating it. In the 19th century, they kind of figured out that the pancreas was involved. All right. So this is what you were asking me about. And it was only until about 1890 that some scientists removed the pancreas from a dog. So there's lots of dog experiments. So that might be disturbing to a lot of people because, you know, dogs are cute. So they removed the pancreas from a dog and then it developed severe diabetes in about three weeks. So oh, wow. That goes to show how critical the pancreas is in this entire operation here. Correct. Exactly. And then it was around, again, the late part of the 19th century that they discovered that there are specific cells, they're called islets. So these islands of cells in the pancreas called the islets of Langerhans might be driving the effects of the pancreas on blood sugar. That sounds like a prequel to Homer, the Odyssey. What, the islets of Langerhans? The Iliad, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. All right. The islets of Langerhans. So then there was this idea that there's a substance that's present in these islets of Langerhans that could be controlling sugar levels, right? And so it was this guy Banting. So Banting, Fred Banting was an orthopedic surgeon oh. at the University of Toronto. I'm not quite sure how he got involved in this, but this was the good old days of medicine, you know, where you're like, I could be an orthopedic surgeon and I'm going to discover insulin. You could just do whatever, you know. Nowadays, you have to be super, super specialized in one specific field. So I'm specialized in pediatric neurology, but just not all of pediatric neurology, but one specific field. Whereas like back in the day, yeah, I'll do this, I'll try this. Like, I think it would have been a better time to be in medicine in some respects. So he thought that maybe the other scientists didn't find insulin because the other areas of the pancreas, which contain digestive enzymes, maybe the digestive enzymes could have destroyed insulin before anyone could extract it. So in other words, if you just remove the pancreas and kind of like grind it all up and then try and look for the proteins, the actual enzymes that are in that mix of pancreatic fluid could have mm. you destroyed it. So... His plan was to tie up the pancreatic ducts of dogs, laboratory dogs, and then leave it so that the cells that produce these harmful enzymes degenerated. So that leaves only the islet cells because these islet cells are more sturdy. And then he would extract that residue. And so that was his kind of plan, right? But the problem is Banting had this idea, but he wasn't an expert in carbohydrate metabolism. So he requested laboratory space under a guy named John James Rickard McLeod, and who was the head of physiology at the University of Toronto. And McLeod at first was a bit reluctant for various reasons, but then Banting kept kind of persisting, I really want to do this. And so McLeod said, okay, fine, I'll do it. And I really thought you were going to say, I'll introduce you to the best, Charles Best. Anyway, okay, good. Maybe there's a moment for that. Well, then he took on an assistant after that. It's true, Charles Best, to help with isolating the insulin. So McLeod helped with the kind of the general structure of the research because he was a physiologist. 
Hmm. And Bess was specialized in the chemical testing of blood to check glucose levels because Banting was like, oh, I'll check urine. But I think both McLeod and Bess were like, no, no, blood would be better. So then how they come McLeod doesn't get any respect? Well, I'm going to get to that. Okay. There's always going to be controversy when it comes to these sort of things. So anyway, they initially started doing the surgery in the dogs, trying to ligate the pancreas. And at the beginning, seven out of 10 of these dogs where they tied this ducked off, died. And then Banting and Bess had to resort to, this is very disturbing, had to buy black market dogs on the street for a few Canadian dollars, you know. Not, Good not old that. days of medicine, eh? Also? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know, I know. <laughs> and so, so basically, then what they did was they got a dog that survived with the tied off pancreatic ducts. Then they took the degenerated pancreas with the enzymes gone, so just the eyelets of Langerhans, and they put it into a paste. Then they warmed it up, okay, to room temperature, and then they injected it into a dog who they had removed a pancreas. So this dog is alive, just had no pancreas, okay? And they took blood samples from the dog every 30 minutes, and then they saw a temporary drop in the blood sugar. So they said, okay, I think we're onto something. Unfortunately, that dog died the next morning because of an infection. But they thought they were onto something. So they kept kind of looking at this. And they eventually started moving because they're like, I don't think we should use dogs anymore. So they moved to cows and they used the pancreas of cows. And they continued trying to extract and uh, concentrate the solution and concentrate so you got a greater and greater amount of what would become insulin you know, over time. So they would eventually use this cow pancreas, kind of isolate the insulin, and then inject into dogs that didn't have a pancreas. And then they got more and more convincing results. At this point, the blood sugar in these dogs that had no pancreas dropped from 0.46% to 0.18%. So then they're like, this is it. The cow pancreas is the way to go. We're going to keep on doing this. But McLeod was like, okay, listen, we got to divert all of our resources into this research because this is the way to go. But there was continued tension between Banting and McLeod. And Banting thought that McLeod was taking all the credit for this work. In fact, and apparently it's also because if you read some other articles, they're like, the lab was really hot and like Banting was really annoyed and him and Bess would have to like escape to the roof with their dogs because it was so boiling hot in the summertime in Toronto when they're trying to do this. So... McLeod was getting also annoyed at Banting because the like he had an attitude. Banting hmm. kept thinking McLeod was trying to take credit for everything. So, you know, there was already tension there. Then a new guy comes into the picture, this guy named James Bertram Collip. All right. This guy's a Canadian biochemist. And his job was because he had had this successful career as a biochemist. So his goal and purpose in the team was to purify insulin. Then they want to test it on rabbits and then humans. So he was kind of, he was going to involve not the mass marketing, but being able to produce it for the mass markets, right? And so he knew kind of the next steps to go. So we're talking like this is basically spring, summer, and now the fall and winter of 1921 when they were working on it. Pretty happy to hear they migrated from dogs to cows. Did the humans come in at some point? So again, this is like, you know, th we're talking about the 1920s, right? So there was a patient, and now is well known in Canadian medical history. His name is Leonard Thompson, a 14-year-old boy, again, with type 1 diabetes, as you call it, juvenile diabetes. And again, when you have no treatment for diabetes, your blood sugar levels can go dangerously high, and you can become comatose and die just from the high glucose levels. So he was drifting in and out of consciousness. He was admitted to the Toronto General Hospital. And basically, he was the first patient to receive insulin because they were kind of calling up Banting and Best and McLeod and saying, like, you got to do something about this guy. And they found a drop in the blood sugar from 0.44% to 0.32%. So it worked a little bit for him, but that was the first patient. But there's other patients who they tried it on, especially ones who are comatose. So they would start to try and use those who are in a kind of a diabetic coma. And there's a quote from Bill Bigelow, who was a young U of T surgeon at the time, who witnessed these early insulin trials. And he says, the comatose patients awakened and were dramatically snatched from death's door. 
you know? So for him seeing this, he thought, and when you think about it, it is miraculous because you had no way of treating this before. So then, you know, as they started working on this and moving into human test subjects, they saw more and more success. So after they purified it more, they went back to that same 14-year-old, Leonard Thompson, and they tried it again on him with his severe diabetes, and his blood sugar went from 0.52% to 0.12% within 24 hours. And ketones, which we can measure in the urine, we talked about that with a ketogenic diet, they also vanished. And so, you know, they realized what was going on. They did more and more patients and they're like, this is it. We kind of, we figured this out. It's our eureka moment. Putting the ewer in urine of eureka moment. Now, interesting, Banting was not involved in a lot of these papers that came out afterwards. And so he was causing, he felt, I guess, that he needed recognition. So he was getting more and more angry and there's more and more conflict and call it, you know, because of this tension, he's like, you know what, I'm just going to leave this and we're not going to get to the purification process. In other words, it won't get to the next level. And apparently him and Banting almost came to blows in the halls of the University of Toronto because of this. However, eventually, you know, they were able to progress to movement on insulin and becoming mass marketed and available. And, you know, were things ever smoothed over between them? Not really. In 1923, a Danish physiologist put forward a Nobel Prize nomination for Banting and McLeod. So they thought, okay, it was Banting's original idea and McLeod's guidance. And remember, this is 1923, a year after they came up with insulin. So it's mm -hmm. a very quick transition from like this product coming out yeah. to being nominated for the Nobel Prize. Usually it takes much longer for Nobel Prizes. So basically, Banting was super angry about McLeod's co-nomination because he still hated McLeod. Mm. And he thought that Best should have been given the nomination. So he said it should have just been Banting and Best. And he almost turned down the award, but then he had a change of heart. So in the end, Banting shared the award in quotation marks and the prize money, which was not in quotation marks. He split it with Best because he oh, thought wow. Best deserved it. So Banting and Best shared that kind of co, you know, winnings. Mm. And then McLeod found that out. And so he shared his credit and prize money with Colin. So in the end, you have these kind of four people who all kind of shared credits. Though we don't talk about Collip and McLeod. I mean, everybody knows Banting and Best, right? So Banting died years later in 1941. And eventually they did acknowledge the Nobel Prize officially acknowledged best contribution to the development of insulin. But I mean, this kicked off this revolution in the treatment of diabetes. Diabetes clinics were established in Toronto at the Christie Street Veterans Hospital, Toronto General Hospital, and of course the Hospital for Sick Children, where I ended up training. U of T had what were called the Connaught Antitoxin Laboratory. So that was used to develop antitoxin. And then they instead basically said, forget about antitoxin, let's just do insulin. They ramped up that production. Then they entered into agreement with Eli Lilly and company to begin large scale production. And that's basically how insulin moved, as we say in medicine, from the bench to the bedside. Clear up one thing for me. Insulin, was it always synthetic or was it actually from animals at some point? So initially, it, it was all from animals. So again, bovine insulin from mm -hmm. cows. Yeah. The first synthetic insulin was produced in 1978. And they ah, used that e. recently. Coli, yeah, they used the E. coli bacteria to produce insulin. And Eli Lilly, again, Eli Lilly, been in the insulin game for a long time, oh. you know? And they made the first commercially available biosynthetic human insulin in 82. And that was under the brand name Humulin. Okay. So, you know, we have this Canadian invention. It changed, you know, the course of healthcare in the world, without a doubt. Interesting, like, again, there was collaboration, but there was a lot of strife. And it's too bad that the strife is sometimes remembered a bit more. But listen, you know, on the $100 bill now, a bottle of insulin is on the Canadian $100 bill. So, and Banting was the first Nobel nominee from Canada ever. So you cannot deny this place of the creation of insulin in Canadian history. And going back to what I said about, you know, Canadians and violence, 
Even the doctors almost coming to blows in the, we love punching it up. Huh? We love a good dust up here in Canada. And yeah, you know, thanks for putting some respect on these other dudes' names. I already forgot the fourth guy, McLeod and? Collip. Collip. Yeah. Just, they don't have the alliteration, Banting and Best. One of the names is Best, for God's sake. These guys didn't stand a chance. that's our show for today let us know what you guys thought very curious to see what your picks would be for the band the movie the tv show that best exemplifies canada definitely let us know we'll put that on social media you guys can respond to us and let us know what you think let us know uh, any other canadian discoveries there are a few other ones that we can talk about i think every once in a while we should do some canadian history i won't spoil any of them for you in case you don't know what some of them are but we can talk about that so reach out to us dr v comedian on twitter facebook instagram dr v comedian and gmail.com let us know what you guys thought and remember that although i'm a doctor i'm not your doctor medical issues we talk about for your interest and information only and they're not medical advice please consult your medical professionals for actual medical advice and remember, eating sugary things does not cause diabetes. So I'm going to go eat a donut right now. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.